Psalm 103, 10. In this psalm, King David looks into the innermost parts of his being, that being his own soul, and challenges himself to find ways to bless the Lord because of all the blessings God has given. For Christians today, it is very important to understand how rich we are because God has saved us from our sins and has assured us an everlasting life in heaven. For today's message, I want all born again believers to think about heaven and get excited for what is to come in eternity. Here are a few things of what we can hope to expect in heaven. One, in heaven we will have an answer to separation. We all understand the pain of separation from those we love, and it certainly is not easy. In the book of Acts, Apostle Paul had to say goodbye to the elders from Ephesus, his friends, and people he invested a lot of time into. Acts 20.37 Nevertheless, amidst the sadness of change, Believers do not grieve like those who have no hope. Paul teaches us that there will be a future reunion for those who believe that Jesus died and rose again. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 2. We will have an answer to suffering and an invitation to rest. It is clear to any mature person that our world is full of pain, hunger, poverty, disease, and ultimately, death. Jesus knows that each and every person alive today must pass through such a broken world. Jesus offers an invitation that is much welcome to any tired soul. Matthew 11:28. The time to accept Jesus' invitation is only available when we are living. Don't wait for this amazing gift until tomorrow. Enter into God's rest today. You see, in heaven, something wonderful is going to happen. God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. You will never cry again. You will never be disappointed again. You will never experience heartbreak or betrayal. And God will personally wipe away your tears. Oh, how we all need that. There are people listening to me right now who need that so desperately. They are tired of crying themselves to sleep, but one day God will wipe all your tears away. And there shall be no death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Just imagine no more pain, no more sickness. Heaven will one day be our reality. Number three, you see in heaven we will have peace and harmony forever. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve both lived in peace and harmony with God and as well each other. But not only that, all nature was rejoicing and worshiped God. Even the animals lived peacefully together since there was no need to hunt one another. Genesis 1, 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. But sadly, 
All this came to an end when Adam and Eve sinned and disturbed the natural order of things. Today we see that in all human relationships and our relationship with creation. We are in constant fights and there is never-ending conflict. Yet, God assures us that one day, in Isaiah 11:6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. On that blessed day, people of every tribe nation, and language will join together to worship God. Revelation 7-9 Fourthly, there will be a new genesis, a new beginning. As Christians, we already know the end of the story. We are winners, and we will all make it to heaven after we die and will live forever with God. The Lord on that blessed day will create a new heaven and a new earth as he makes a new beginning, a new Genesis. Revelations 21, 1. In the new world, God will welcome his people to live with him without fear and sin. We should all desire to live in heaven where there no longer will be any curse, where we'll live forever by God's light and there shall be no more curses, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 22, 3 the fifth thing, there will be some incredible, incomparable, and eternal worshiping of God. Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. King David expressed this desire to dwell with God. There's nothing more beautiful than for children of God to be in the presence of God. In heaven, we will never get tired of praising our amazing Lord because we will never come to an end of discovering his unlimited goodness and the wonders of the works of his hands. Every moment in heaven will bring a breathtaking view of his beauty and his love. 7. There will be treasures and rewards in heaven. The prize of a heavenly crown is not salvation, because salvation is a free gift to anyone who believes in the gospel, but a crown is given for service to the Lord. It's for those who are self-controlled, who refuse to break the laws of the Bible, there are only two kinds of people in the world, the people who have self-discipline and the people who don't. Christian, dream about winning the ultimate award and the Lord will say unto thee, his Lord said to them, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's Matthew 25, 21. In Philippians 3.14, it says, I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What crowns are you going to win? It is safe to say that at one point or another, all of us have experienced theft or property loss due to unforeseeable circumstances. For example, it might have been our vehicles were either stolen or crashed, homes are flooded, our personal belongings stolen. Such a dangerous world makes Jesus' statement not to put our trust in earthly treasures very meaningful. Earthly wealth is temporary. Nothing lasts forever. 
we must focus on acquiring spiritual treasures instead. Jesus is waiting for you. Are you ready for heaven? John 10, 27 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give on to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Make sure you subscribe to the new Line of Judah Prayer channel. Click the link in the description. The goal of our Christian race is not to inherit this world and have every good thing in life. The ultimate prize we will receive at the end of our Christian journey is the reward of eternal life in heaven. There is nothing we can own and can boast of that is as glorious or eternal as making it to heaven in the end and reigning with God. Absolutely nothing. Daily, as we go about living our lives, we should have our gaze fixed on that glorious plane and the joy we would experience when we finally meet Him. We shouldn't be so focused on this world. It is transient, a passing phase. This world is not our home. Heaven is our future, eternal dwelling place. It is our final destination. This is why the Bible warns us to store our treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, 19-20 Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. The day we are caught up in the sky when our Lord Jesus comes to take us home will be a day of indescribable joy and delight. We cannot even begin to comprehend the splendor and beauty of heaven. Just imagine a place where there are no worries, afflictions, death, injustice, and loss. A place so beautiful where everything is so perfect and beyond description, a place where we will just be singing and worshiping God, beholding His glory. Heaven is that place, my brother and my sister. It is a place of unimagined blessing, a spectacular place. We, the saints of God who will be registered in heaven, having been made perfect by the blood of Jesus, which was shed on the cross of Calvary, will assemble with an innumerable company of angels before the most holy God. We imagine heaven and imagine a beautiful home, but have we really sat to imagine what we will be doing when we finally get there or what a typical day in heaven will look like? The Bible didn't just give a sensory and detailed description of heaven. It also told us of the events that will take place in heaven and how we will feel when we finally meet Christ. Here are some of the facts that we should know about heaven. We won't become angels. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, we will be changed. Our corruptible body is going to put on an incorruptible body and our mortal shall put on immortality. We will have glorified bodies, glorified bodies which will be able to stand the glorious presence of our heavenly Father and the dazzling light of our Lord Jesus. Indeed, we will no longer wear this body. I am sure we are all familiar with this saying, when someone we really loved and when such a kind person dies, we say, Heaven just received another angel. As much as this is harmless and our attempt at romanticizing their death as a transition to a better place, it isn't scriptural. We won't be bored. I once received a hilarious question from an inquisitive kid who asked me if we would ever be bored in heaven. I asked her why she thought something like that would ever happen. She said she was taught that the only thing we will be doing when we get to heaven would be praising God. Wouldn't that be boring after a while, she asked. Even though I smiled at such innocence that necessitated her question, I marveled at the great wisdom behind that question. If there is anywhere so exciting and colorful, it is heaven. God is infinite. We can't come to the end of his glory and love. 
Also, the unit of measuring time in heaven isn't the same as what we have here at the moment on earth. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 8, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The reason why the four living creatures cry out, Holy, 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 according to Revelations 4, 8, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. These living creatures, the Bible says, they do not rest day and night. They just don't say, Holy, 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 to while out time. But it is because God keeps revealing something new, which they have never seen, and each time they cry holy. We will experience emotions. Different emotional feelings were ascribed to God in the scriptures at different times. Love, sadness, happiness, anger, and jealousy. We will still have and express emotions, but this time they will be feelings of joy, glee, and happiness. Even when we cry, our tears won't be as unto sorrow or those ones he used to collect in a bottle as mentioned in Psalm 56, 8. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? They will be tears of joy, and that kind which say, Victory at last. I made it home, Lord. We will also rejoice when we are finally reunited with our loved ones who have died and made it to heaven too. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We will receive a crown. According to the measure of our work, we will receive different crowns in heaven. There are different crowns for various people according to the quality of their work and service in God's vineyard. The Bible highlighted five types of crowns for believers in heaven. The incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown is for believers who dealt with flesh and brought it under control. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The crown of righteousness. The crown of glory is for all believers that are earnestly waiting for his second coming and love his appearing. The crown of righteousness is obtained only by faith. 2 Timothy 4, 8 Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. The Crown of Life The crown of life is prepared for believers who endured prosecution for righteousness' sake. It is for people who went through persecutions, suffering, and trials. Revelation 2.10 It is a promise. The crown of glory. It is the crown for people in the fivefold ministry. Apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, and every person watching over God's flock and feeding his sheep. It is for people who are passionate about the gospel and spreading it to every end of the earth. 1 Peter 5, 2-4 This crown, the Bible says, it does not fade away. The crown of rejoicing. It is for every believer, every saved person that believes in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 As Christians, we already know the end of the story. We are winners and we will all make it to heaven after we die and will live forever with God. The Lord on that blessed day will create a new heaven and a new earth as he makes a new beginning, a new Genesis. Revelations 21, 1. In the new world, God will welcome his people to live with him without fear and sin. We should all desire to live in heaven where there no longer will be any curse 
where we'll live forever by God's light. And there shall be no more curses, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 22, 3 In conclusion, if there are any apt adjectives at all to describe what it will look like in heaven, it will be joy, excitement, and elation. May we be supplied with the grace to run our race successfully and make it to heaven at last. We live in a world that is filled with uncertainty. Every day conflicts are raging in the world. Neighbors argue with one another, even family members argue with one another. There is so much distress, heartache, pain and suffering. More and more we are faced with circumstances that challenge our faith. Living in general can take a tower on you. Everyone you come across in life is in a battle of some kind. Someone said hello to you today with a smile on their face, but cried themselves to sleep last night. Everyone is in some sort of battle. Some are battling for their health, others emotional pain, others heartache, others financial turmoil. Just know everyone is dealing with some sort of turmoil, but that will one day change, according to the Bible. Close your eyes for a minute and imagine that all the turmoil has come to an end. The conflicts have ceased and there is no longer any more selfishness on the earth. There is no more pain nor sorrow. Heaven is mentioned in scripture more than 600 times. According to the theological dictionary of the Bible, in the Old Testament, the noun heaven is used 320 times, and in the New Testament, the noun heaven is used 284 times. Therefore, if Christians want to long to be in the presence of Jesus, it is wise for them to become heavenly minded. People believe that the last blessing you'll ever get is going to heaven. We must know that after getting to heaven, blessings are waiting for us there. The majority of people believe there are just two blessings awaiting us, which are, we will receive a crown and the mansion Jesus promised us. But that is not all. There are a lot of blessings that await us, but today we are only going to look at six blessings that await us when we get to heaven. We have been reading about these blessings but we haven't been paying attention to them because we think that blessings are only about having money or success on earth and then getting a crown in heaven. Blessing is far beyond that. 1. The first blessing is that God will dwell with us and we will be his people forever. It is not something that we would like to miss out on. This is God dwelling with man. Revelation 21, 1-3 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Did you notice that three times in Revelation 21 verse 3 the Bible says, with them, with them, with them. It's as if the complete Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all come together in verse 3 and unite with all the saints. God will dwell with us. We will be his people. This is the greatest blessing that we will ever get in heaven. 
God dwelling with us means that we will see God. I used to say to myself that when I get to heaven in the last days, I will personally go to God and ask him some questions. I'm not saying we will be asking God questions or something like question and answer time. I'm just displaying how happy I would be to be able to see God and speak with him directly. Do you know the meaning of forever? It simply means eternity. God will be with us till eternity. There is no time to say what particular day we are or when everything will be over. 2. The second blessing is that He will be our God. This second blessing dropped a thought in me. And I know you might think of it too. Is it until we get to heaven that God becomes our God? Is He not our God now? My translation to this is that God will be our Father. The way we see God from earth even as Christians would be completely different from the way we'll see Him face to face. Right now we approach God through faith, but in heaven we won't approach God through faith. We will see Him. When God says He would be our God, it means He would be everything we want. He would be all for us. There are times when God mentioned to people of being their God. When He says He would be our God, He is simply saying we will become His people and nothing can change that. We will not have any reason to serve any other gods. It is a blessing that God will forever be ours. We will not be rejected. He would always be with us. Hebrews 8.10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. 3. The third blessing is God will wipe away our tears. This is something that should give us joy and hope in the glory of God. We need to keep reminding ourselves of this particular blessing. We will have no reason to shed tears anymore. We have been through many things in life. Things that make us shed tears. Things that break us and make us hopeless. The good news is that all the hopelessness and tears will be over someday. And that will be when we are in the presence of our God. We should be happy about this. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. This is a message to cheer you up. That failure will not last forever. Those tears you've been shedding secretly will not last forever. God will wipe away your tears and you will be okay. All that will fill our faces would be joy because we will be in his presence day and night till eternity. Psalm 16, 11. Thou wilt shew me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. When we get to heaven, there will be joy and in the hands of God is a pleasure. There will be nothing to worry about. There will be no frustration. There will be no failure. There will be no disappointment. Everything will be perfect with God. Encourage one another with this. Let every Christian know that no condition is permanent. Your joy will start from this earth till the day of redemption. God will always make you smile. 4. The fourth blessing. There would be no death. Never again will you have to go to a graveyard. Never again will you have to see a casket. Never again will a family weep and mourn. Never again will you receive a phone call to tell you that a loved one has passed on. Never again will you hear about a high school friend or teacher who has passed on. Blessed God, I'm ready for that day. Every second someone is receiving news of the passing of a loved one. Never again, never again. You will have no reason to mourn over your loved ones. Everyone will be happy together forever and no more fear of death. The Bible made it clear that there would be no death. That is not all. If there are no deaths anymore, that means the things that cause death will not exist. They would be gone. Sickness won't be able to enter the gates of heaven. Death won't be able to enter the gates of heaven. There will be nothing but life where you are heading, nothing but joy where you are going. There will be nothing but perfect health, no medication, no checkups. 5. There would be no sorrow. Another blessing from God is that there would be no sorrow. 
Sorrow is a display of distress. Distress that is caused by a great loss. Sorrow is not displayed through shedding tears, but it can be kept in the heart without showing on the outside. And there are people who are listening to me right now who don't shed tears, but they fight inner battles with sorrow. And the truth is, at one point in our lives, we have felt little, if not great, sorrow. We don't like the feeling. We don't want to go back into it. But God is promising this, that there would be no sorrow in heaven. Should we trade this for anything? 6. No more pain. Pain comes from different sources. Pain could be physical, the one that comes from overworking. Physical pain also comes from sicknesses or diseases. The pain can come from an accident. There is emotional pain. This pain comes from the loss of something important, such as a house, a business, a company, a job, or loved ones. The pain that comes from the loss of a loved one is usually grieving. All of these pains are nothing good. No one wants to feel an atom of pain. Pain causes trauma. Pain gotten from something may develop into becoming a phobia. If the pain stays long in someone's life, it is developed to become something worse. What pain are you going through? God says the pain would be over. There would be nothing called pain because joy would be forever present. No heartbreaks, no death of loved ones. Everything will be fine. This is a blessing we must glue ourselves to and work to make it to heaven. That's heaven for you. Corinthians 9 verses 24 through 27 Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one who beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Since ancient times, athletics were the most popular entertainment pastimes in any Greek society. The two most well-known of these athletic sports were the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games, which were held in the city of Corinth every three years. Therefore, it is a fitting illustration for the Apostle Paul to use to explain the heavenly reward system to his audience in the Corinthian church. The people sitting in the church were intimately aware of these athletic contests, especially with winning the top prize. Anyone who won first place received a pine wreath crown. The winner would be made an instant superstar to be remembered forever. It was the highest honor that the most powerful leaders of the day could give to a person. They were essentially immortalized, but this made the competition fierce and extremely difficult. Contestants, in order to qualify for a main event, had to provide proof of 10 months of training. And then for the next 30 days before the start of the games, they had to be completely devoted to train every single day for their sport, three of which are mentioned in the Bible, running, boxing, and wrestling. The winners would be listed in the Coliseum Hall of Fame and gained notoriety with the elites of the day. Likewise, in the Christian life, the competition to win souls and to glorify God is open to everybody. The Bible speaks of crowns as an eternal inheritance. Think, if you will, of an earthly inheritance of a large sum of money or a personal house, all good things. But they are completely blown away by the rewards that await a believer in Jesus Christ. There are five crowns mentioned in the New Testament. A crown of righteousness, an incorruptible crown, a crown of life, a crown of glory, a crown of rejoicing. Will you get one? The incorruptible crown or the crown of self-denial. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. 
Apostle Paul teaches us here that life is like a race, with the winners receiving good rewards for all of eternity in heaven. This unfading crown of self-control is for that persistent racer that consistently brings their flesh and its many temptations under the Spirit's control, resisting everything that would disqualify them from the race. This is the crown reserved for holy living. In Romans 6 verses 12 through 14, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those who are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. This is the crown of discipline. Are you holy and focused? On what? In Luke 9 verse 23, And he said to them all, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. The second crown, the crown of life. James 1 verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. In Revelation 2.10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This crown is especially for those who endure suffering and being faithful to Jesus, no matter the cost. The Apostle Paul would qualify for such a crown. In 2 Corinthians 11, 25 and 27, thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. This crown is for those who have a strong desire that God be glorified through trials. It's a crown that represents the outmost love for God. The third crown is the crown of glory or the elder's crown. In 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 2, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, feed the flock of God which is among you. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. This is a crown for those who are pastors or teachers, promised to those who live as an example to the flock. These are the trusted, and faithful shepherds who ministered to the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ in humility, dedication to spiritual things, and as servants and ambassadors for Jesus Christ on behalf of the church. The fourth crown is the crown of righteousness, or the crown of love for Christ's return. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. This crown is given to any believer who's looking forward to the second coming of Christ. Do you live with the daily mindset that perhaps today the Lord is coming back? It's a nice reminder to hope in an anticipatory way that the Lord is returning soon. This crown will go to those who faithfully watch for Christ each day living on earth. This crown is for anticipating Christ. Are you? This crown is for following all the way to the finishing line, the calling the Lord has given you. Are you? It's a crown to those who wanted to finish the race to the very end, knowing He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11, 6. Jesus told His disciples He would return in John 14, 3. He said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The angels declared he would return in Acts 1.11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven? shall so come in like manner 
as ye have seen him go into heaven. The letters to the early churches said he will return. This crown is given to any believer who's looking forward to the second coming of Christ. Do you live with the daily mindset that perhaps today the Lord is coming back? It's a nice reminder to hope in an anticipatory way that the Lord is returning soon. This crown will go to those who faithfully watch for Christ each day living on earth. The fifth crown is the crown of rejoicing or the soul winner's crown. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? In Philippians 4, 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. This is the witnessing crown. You will rejoice at seeing people you witness to up there in heaven. The unselfish worker who faithfully wins souls gets the crown of honor and rejoicing. The only things we can take with us are people. Are you taking anyone with you? Who? Your friends, your neighbors, your children? Now in conclusion, the prize of a heavenly crown is not salvation because salvation is a free gift to anyone who believes in the gospel, but a crown is given for service to the Lord. It's for those who are self-controlled, who refuse to break the laws of the Bible. There are only two kinds of people in the world, the people who have self-discipline and the people who don't. Christian, dream about winning the ultimate award and the Lord will say unto thee, his Lord said to them, well done, Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's Matthew 25, 21. In Philippians 3, 14, it says, I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What crowns are you going to win? We as believers grossly mistaken that acquiring heavenly crowns is a foregone conclusion. If athletes on this earth have to be dedicated to their sports to spend hour after hour training, doing push-ups, push-up after push-up, drill after drill, rep after rep, just to attain a piece of worldly glory. Why do we think that the heavenly crowns are so easy to obtain? Why do we think that attending church once a week and singing a couple of praise songs will enable us to obtain these heavenly crowns? It is much more than this. It will take a commitment, total commitment, from Monday to Sunday, from dusk until dawn. You will have to travel the whole nine yards. Greatness costs what it costs. And the crowns of heaven do not go on sale. You do not get a buy one, get one free deal. You will have to pay the full price and that price is total commitment. Total commitment. These crowns are not for carnal living. On that day when the crowns are handed out, what will you say? What will you do? When our lives are being reviewed, Every day will be in review. This is a day in which we cannot avoid. It doesn't matter if you run to the east or to the west. You will stand before him. You will come before his judgment seat. You cannot outrun a God who can speak whole worlds out of nothing. It's nothing to him to raise the dead and to bring them to the judgment seat that they may speak to him about the way that they've lived and thought and spoken and acted. And God, the great king and the only potentate guarantees that every evil word will be remembered. Every evil act will be called to account. Every evil thought will be published openly. We don't know how long this day will be because we will be eternity. So if God chooses, 
he could go through the life of all the billions of people that have ever lived and go through each of their life at its present speed. So he could take 24 hours to examine 24 hours. Just think how different we would live our life if we had this idea in our minds, that God will one day examine every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, every month, of every year, of every decade, of every century. I'm asking you to live in such a way that you know you will have to give account one day of your life. Before I became a Christian, through faith in Jesus Christ, I used to wonder, is this all we had to look forward to? What would happen to me after this is over? It really used to bother me, the uncertainty of not knowing what would come after I pass on. This internal dialogue became overwhelming at times, and the only adequate way I can describe it is it felt as if I was drowning. That's the truth, it felt as if I was drowning in it. And in the ocean of my own thoughts, I found a lifeline. And that lifeline was the Bible. And in the Bible, I met a man called Jesus, my Lord Jesus. And what astonished me about Jesus is that Jesus lived his whole life with the expectation and hope and motivation of one day going back home to heaven. The assurance of heaven ought to make a difference in our lives just like it made a difference in the life of Jesus. Well you may say to me, you cannot be sure you're going to heaven. You cannot be sure you're going to heaven until you die. But that's not true. Men and women in the Bible knew that they were going to heaven. Our Lord Jesus did. John 14 in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. This wasn't a privilege reserved only for Jesus. John knew he was going to heaven. Yes, he did. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 5.13 These things I have written unto you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. King David, Israel's greatest king, knew he was going to heaven. According to Psalms 23 verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Paul knew he was going to heaven. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12b, he says, For I know, for I know whom I have believed in, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him, against that day. There are some distinct signs, some residual evidences, some clear benefits that demonstrate that a believer is saved and that he or she is going to heaven. I don't believe that God would put us into suspense as to whether or not we will make it to heaven. We do not necessarily have to go before the judgment throne before we know our eternal destination. There are clear indicators that prove a believer is saved and that they are going to heaven. The assurance of heaven starts from earth. The first evidence that we're going to look at today is that you have given your life to Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a gift. For anyone that would ever get into heaven, salvation is a must. Salvation is the gateway 
and the spiritual highway that leads to eternal bliss in heaven. However, salvation can only be attained, can only be attained through faith in the finished work of Christ. Anyone who finds it hard to accept and believe the fact that Jesus came to this earth and died for our sins and died for the sins of humanity and that he resurrected on the third day for them will not dwell in heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. The first and foremost evidence that you are going to heaven is that you have given your life to Christ by exercising faith in the work of his redemption. Salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ, not by works of the law. If we attain salvation by works, it will imply that we earn it ourselves. You cannot work your way into heaven. There are many people who believe that moral living is their way to heaven, but that's not true. Morality and salvation are two different things. Salvation is the free gift of God, which can only be received through faith. Although we are saved to do good works, our good works cannot save us. If you have not given your life to Christ, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter into heaven. Jesus said that except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the first initial sign, the first initial evidence is that they have given their life to Christ. And once they give their life to Christ, a transformation begins to take place. And the signs of this transformation begin to show. One of which is that you begin to become a servant of God. We see this in John 12, 26. It says, if any man serve me, let him follow me and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now I want you to look at this phrase here. And where I am, there shall also be my servant. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. Here Jesus is referring to heaven where he says where I am, where Jesus is, is where his servants will be and that is heaven. At salvation, our self will is lost. We no longer belong to ourselves because we have been bought with a price. If you still find it hard to submit yourself to the will of God and to the leading of his spirit, it means there is an area in your salvation you need to work out. Remember, the Bible instructs us clearly in Philippians 2.12 work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is a unique remark. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Speaks of ongoing obedience for those already saved. It's crucial to note that Paul is not telling us, is not telling them to work for their salvation. This statement implies a need to live out, to practice, to demonstrate and exhibit the salvation which believers have in Christ. At salvation, we accept Jesus by faith, not just as a savior, but as our Lord. The implication of this is that we believe that Christ died for us more so. We submit ourselves under his rule. He is our Lord. Lord means master. And that's exactly what Christ is to us. The problem is, that many believers have accepted Christ as Savior, but they do not want to accept him as Lord. We are to be servants of Christ while he is becoming our Lord. We need to die to our flesh and self-will in order to live in eternal life. A clear evidence that someone is going to heaven is that they serve and are obedient to the commands of Jesus Christ. God is the center of their life. God is their very top priority in their life. So I ask you today, is the Lord the top priority in your life? Does he hold the central seat in your life? Is he number one in your life? Are you sure Christ is leading you? How obedient are you to his commands? Are you earnestly trying to keep his word? 
The third sign is a peaceful heart. John 14 verse 1 to 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. When Jesus was about to die on the cross, he was still comforting the disciples. Jesus is amazing. Jesus is the dictionary definition of strength. He was about to die on the cross, yet he was the one doing the comforting. His disciples were scared of what they were going to do without him. However, Jesus gave them the promise to return to take them where he is after he has prepared a place for them. And this promise was just not to the disciples. This promise is for you and me. A believer that has the assurance of heaven has peace in their hearts. And these three verses from Jesus should be held closely to the heart of every believer. Every time you were worried, you need to remember that this world is not your home and let not your heart be troubled. You need to remember John chapter 14 and remember that one day the Lord is coming back for you. He promised you, he said it, I will come again. Your heart won't be troubled if you remember that one day you are going home. One day you are going to see the king. One day you will be in heaven. And one day, all you'll be able to see, as far as your eyes can see, is angels upon angels upon angels. In heaven, they shall be no more weeping. There will be no such thing as sickness or pain, or disappointment or divorce. Every pain you have ever experienced, even the pain that you're experiencing now, will be a distant memory. This is why our Lord told us, Let not your hearts be troubled. You have heaven to look forward to. You have heaven to look forward to. This is why as Christians, God has given us peace that surpasses all understanding. The Bible gives testimony to the peace given by Jesus. In John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This kind of peace is exclusive to you and I as children of God. And it's another indication that you are one day going to heaven. The passage continues saying a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them, they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. You will finally get to see God. The God who you felt His presence whilst you were on earth. The God who protected you. I honestly believe when we are in heaven and we look back over our lives, everything will be revealed. We will be able to see the times God saves us from bad situations, and we will be able to see all the times God blocked us from making bad decisions. We will be able to see the great gift God gave us during this life that we currently take credit for. And we will turn and look into the face of God and realize truly it was Him. It was Him who was there all the time. It was Him who picked you up when you had no more strength. It was Him who gave you the ability to work and provide for your loved ones. It was Him who gave you every good gift. I must reiterate what I said earlier. 
we will not have cause to cry. But I believe we feel things we have never felt before to see him, God, your creator, your true father. Oh, what a glorious day that will be.